Hey listeners, welcome to the Logos Project. I'm really proud of this episode and grateful to my guest, Dr. Brendan Triffitt. Dr. Triffitt did his PhD at the University of Melbourne in the thoughts of John Milbank and Thomas Aquinas. In this episode, we talk about numerous subjects such as church politics, mystery, dogma, Thomism, and much more. First of all, thank you to all my faithful listeners. If you want to see me upgrade to YouTube, you can help me buy that nice camera by supporting the show at patreon.com slash the Logos Project. Without further ado, here's this week's episode. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Dom, with the Logos Project. In this episode, I am joined by Dr. Brandon Triffitt to talk about all things theology. Enjoy. So, Brandon, thank you for joining us on an episode of the Logos Project. It's really good to have you with us. Great to have you, Dom, too, and I'm, I'm very excited and grateful that uh, you've invited me on, and I'm excited about what you're doing there. Your enthusiasm is um, refreshing. Thank you. We were talking earlier about, you know, the, <laughs> the tribalism, the tensions in the church, mm. the, the politics, the theological back mm. and forth and all that stuff, and maybe we could just kind of have a casual conversation, try to bring some light yeah. to it or some peace, maybe? Yeah, yeah, so... I was speaking with Dom just five minutes earlier about how we feel like we both live in this in-between space where people are debating about whether the lockdown is good or whether people should have vaccines or not, or whether vaccines should be mandated or whether we're debating whether traditionalism is, whether Vatican II is good or bad. I, and I, I believe Dom as well, we live in this in-between space where we'll be amongst some friends and we'll find ourselves pushing back against that and saying, oh, hold on a minute, you know, let's add a bit of a qualification there. But then we, with other friends, we're pushing back against them as well. So yes. what I've learned is that experience can actually be given a bit of conceptual language. And I, I spent a lot of time reading Hegel, spent a lot of time on just the few first chapters and the preface of the phenomenology of spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, why that was important to me was that Hegel allows you to understand that in order to get at the truth often if not always there are two sides to something and that if you come down too early on one side you're going to miss out on the truth on the other side and in order to get at the truth often we have we have to inhabit this in between space where we're we're trying to reconcile these two positions that are in tension and my view is that we should be happy inhabiting that in-between space rather than coming down on either side. Yeah. And uh, what do you think about that, Dom? I, um, I relate to the experience because I was actually talking to another friend of mine and he said something about before you start doing theology, you hear about these big debates on, on the cultural level. There's these different positions, right? And, you know, you, on both sides, you have this position or that position, but when you, um, you study more deeply, delving deeper and trying to enter into the literature, you end up just knowing about arguments at a higher level. But it's almost yeah. as if nothing is really settled. You just learn about new arguments and yeah. there's good arguments on both sides. And so it's really, yeah, it's, it's kind of frustrating. But um, Well, it's frustrating in a way if you want certainty yeah. and closure about things. And that, that comes down to personality as well and also cultures that we're in. Some cultures... Are more comfortable with i guess you could call it ambiguity or openness mm -hmm. and some cultures want more certainty and closure i think it was jung's temperaments where you have your four letters and you can either be a p or a j and i think j's want closure whereas mm -hmm. p's are open are open to new experiences and uncertainty and i'm, I'm more of a p <laughs> gotcha yeah. so one thing that i've noticed is that just for example i did an interview with dr de clue about the controversy between nature and grace and you mm. have on one side the uh, neo-scholastics who follow suarez and before him cajetan and claim to go back to saint thomas rightfully or wrongfully mm. i don't know and mm. uh, and the idea is that um 
there is this possibility of a pure nature world and that man has two ends, one natural and one supernatural. And on, on the other side, you know, I found out that Henri de Lubac basically kind of said, no, no, Cajetan went wrong, uh, Suarez followed suit, and turns out Aquinas clearly says that there is only one end. And he even, hmm. so Dr. Duclos was telling me, he even, uh, de Lubac cites Bellarmine in this area, that mm -hmm. basically, mm -hmm. no, man has one end. It's a twofold end, but only one can fully satisfy him, and that is his only mm -hmm. end, which is the beatific mm -hmm. vision. And so you have these two sides of the debates, and then it was mm -hmm. supposedly uh, settled at the council. And then after that, you have Dr. Lawrence Feingold, who comes out with this work on nature and grace saying no in fact the newest classics were right all along so i'm very mm -hmm. confused i'm very perplexed um yeah it, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't necessarily trouble me i mean it kind of does because i do like to get answers so going back to your personality things <laughs> but um uh, but at the same time i i do have a deep trust in the church and, and it's not a yeah, naive yeah. trust i understand that we're, we're dealing yeah, with yeah. The, you know, a church that is both human and divine, but I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, uh, well, I, I have an interesting position on this. I, I found that um, when I studied John Milbank, I found that he was doing two things at once, mm -hmm. and he was conflating these two things. He wanted to argue that it makes no sense in that it's a, it's a contradictory position to say that the human person could have existed without an ordering to the beatific vision without an ordering to knowing the Trinity in an intimate way, right? And I tend to believe, I, I, I have that view. I don't know what you'd call it, but mm -hmm. on my view, it's not just that God didn't want to or God wouldn't create a human person in that position of having a purely natural end, mm -hmm. but that that wouldn't be a human person. Mm -hmm. But in my view, to be a person is to be called into supernatural communion with god and once i say that you're going to have a lot of time to say oh what about this what about this what about this and it opens a can of worms but anyway yes, yes. Uh, rather than defending the view i'm just going to outline what i tend to believe okay so that's milbank's view okay, okay. but he also says that is aquinas's view mm -hmm. he runs together two things and i think it would be more helpful if he said okay let's put the exegetical question aside because that's a different question from what's substantially true because mm -hmm. what i believe i believe aquinas does actually it does actually say that it's possible it's hypothetically possible for god to have created the human race with a purely natural end because mm -hmm. he does actually look at that possibility and i became quite clear about this in reading a book let me just if i have it now, it was a book by Osborne about the love of self and love of God in the 13th century, I think, or 12th and 13th centuries. Mm. And he goes through the passages in which Aquinas looks at the hypothetical possibility, but it's a real possibility, that God has created the human race. We haven't fallen and we haven't been given grace. Mm -hmm. And Aquinas if that reading is correct, and I believe it is, Aquinas says that that could have happened. Mm. But the reason why he raises that as a possibility is because he's asking about can the creature, including the human person, can the creature love God above itself? Mm. He wants to look at that pure nature situation to see would we still have loved God above self in that situation even without grace? Mm. And he says yes, because of the relation between the part and the whole because okay. we participate in god and the part always loves the whole more than itself because it finds its good and its actuality in the whole more than in itself so oh wow that wow. sold me yeah aquinas does believe it's possible but the thing is after reading milbank's thought i came to the conclusion that in order to if you're going to posit a universe in which creatures are participating in god you already have to posit a universe in which, in some sense, God himself has breathed himself out and we all inhabit God. You know, in him we live and move and have our being, as it says in Acts, Paul's drawing on Stoicism there. And you might want to call it grace. I think that is our existential situation of being called to communion with God, even though it's not yet infused 
grace or sanctifying grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so are you saying that uh, the very act of creation, the very act of, of nature coming to be is itself a gift. Therefore it's in a sense already graced. Yeah. This is where you've got to distinguish between different senses of grace. You can't okay. really get anywhere unless we do that. So for Aquinas <laughs> and for the more traditional Thomist, you've got two senses of grace. Grace is a disposition on the side of God. So it's, it's God's decision or will to show favor on the human person. Mm -hmm. And that can be the favor of deciding to send his son into the world to forgive us. Mm -hmm. And it's also the favor of deciding to elevate us to a supernatural calling. The other side of grace for Aquinas is the grace that's a habit. It's an, something infused in us. It's an accident of the soul and a habit. And it's, it's a habit that creates a new type of existence from which flow uh, the supernatural virtues, if I've understood that correctly. But what you'll find is there's a third sense or modality of grace, which is in between, which Thomists will not accept. It's not an accident of the soul. It's more like, more like an energy that is put forth. And that energy is God. And we, we can enter into that energy and synergize with it when we start going into that area then we start debating and, and drawing on some of the, the the gregory of palamas stuff yeah and then it becomes more complicated although the way milbank goes with it is he prefers the theories of bulgarkov mm -hmm. in which he talks about divine sophia and if i've understood him correctly uh, milbank correctly mm -hmm. sophia is just god as given forth mm. and this this makes sense to me and this is something to which i'm inclined to believe sophia with a capital s uh the way milbank's using it, it is just god breathes forth as the matrix the the ground in which we live and move and have our being and yeah the aristotelian metaphysics that aquinas draws on doesn't allow you to have that mm. Because for him, grace is either so that disposition on the side of God or an accident in the soul. But this is this is neither. This is a ground. It's not an accident of the soul, but it's something that we're existing in. See how that can't be an accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You called it, I think, in your article, the ontic grounds for being. Is that correct? Ontological ground, I think. Yeah. Whereas accidents are ontic. That's just the the names that I used in that article yeah gotcha this is interesting because i'm i'm reminded of saint maximilian colby who speaks of the blessed virgin mary as uh, the immaculata the immaculate conception but he speaks of her in, in a certain sense as a and, and i hope <laughs> i don't uh, a lot of protestant listeners if they hear this are probably going to balk at this but he speaks of her as a quasi incarnation <laughs> of the holy spirit so, oh you just lost half of your subscribers, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I probably did. Um, but he obviously he's not saying that Mary is divine, just as much as we are not divine. Uh, but we are called to divinity through theosis. But he seems to be saying that if Mary is the perfect creature, the perfect human, in a sense, mm -hmm. like she is th the one that has been conceived in God's mind, you know, so like the logos containing the archetypes of all that exists. I'm, kind of drawing from my my undergrad studies here sorry about that but so if mary is the perfect expression of god's creative act then i find it interesting that mm. bulgakov talks about sophia as kind of a, an emanation of, of god and it, it sounds a little mm. bit like like what saint maximilian was saying and also that the fathers have tied hokma in hebrew or sophia in in well, greek but latin is they've tied it to typologically to the blessed virgin yeah so yeah, is there look, maybe a connection there? I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely uh, when when theologians and, and people like Bulgarkov and other people who uh, um, have an affinity for that sort of language, it becomes, it can become more poetic. I'm not saying that that means it's invalid, not at all. It just can become more poetic and fluid. So it can be harder to, bring an analytic precision to it once it goes into that. 
Mm-hmm. And I tend to try and want to create more precision without being dry and analytical in, in, in that caricatured sense. But yeah, from memory, and, and Michael Martin, Michael Martin has a book on Sophia. Have you heard of Michael Martin? I have not, no. All right. He's got a whole book about it. And from memory, you can use the term Sophia in both the divine sense, but also the feminine created sense. Mm-hmm. So you could say, look, there's there's the divine Sophia, which is literally divine, mm-hmm. which is God himself poured out, as I was saying. And you could also say there's this other Sophia, which is just creation with a capital C as the matrix of everything else. And if you're inclined, you could say that is Mary as the womb of all creation or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. So yes. if you were to say that, that's like there's two layers. Yeah. There's... Yeah, so we're we're in the divine matrix, but within that, there's a there's the created matrix. Yes, and we're all inhabiting that. And I think you can make sense of that a bit if you think of the created matrix as like the church, because yes, you know, God God is the one who's giving us our grace, and God is the one who's the alpha and omega. The church isn't isn't our alpha and omega. However, the church is that material thing in the world through which uh, a lifeline to God is. It's like yeah, it's like the umbilical cord, isn't it? The church is like the umbilical cord. Yeah. 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 No, that, that's super helpful. I was thinking of something. Oh, yes. In your article, you talk about participation. You use the Greek word, is it metathexis? Is that correct? Mythexis. Yeah. Mythexis. Sorry. Mythexis. And this is a platonic term, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It's not only used by him, but it's definitely associated with him. Yeah. It, it means okay. to. Uh, gosh. There's a great article by David Schindler on the etymology of it but it, it just escapes me all the subtleties of that. But when it, when it goes into the Latin, um, the etymology is to take part. Okay. Now, might this be related to Sophia, like the divine Sophia and the created Sophia? Because the, the church does, through, through Christ, partake in divinity in a sense. But that's, the, but that's redemptive participation. But what about like original participation through creation? So I'm, I'm I'm curious about the difference and the tension between those two aspects. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think you're onto the right thing there. In that, something that I find frustrating when I read theology and even a lot of communio theology is they throw participation around a lot and then <laughs> making it do a lot of work. But as I tried to explain in the article, what was it, what did I call it? Processio and I think I've forgotten here. what I've called my own article. <laughs> yeah, and the place fine. of ontic being. That's right. That's right. That's right. Processio and the place of ontic being. So that's a Heythrop article I did a long time ago. And since then, since then, I've been writing a lot. Yes. Madly and, and just getting my own ideas together. And the project that I have in my mind is too big. If you do things in a too big <laughs> way, you never publish anything. That's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, yeah. What's happened. And plus family and stuff. Yes, um, yes. Uh, where were we? We're talking about, yeah, I, I, I get frustrated yeah. because people throw about the word participation and they make it do a lot of work, but in different contexts, it has to mean slightly different things. Okay. And, um, and Aquinas goes through different senses of participation and he's got one sense in which it's either the accident participates in the substance or a substance participates in an accident. It mm-hmm. might even be both. Now, that's not the paradigm to use when we're talking about the relationship between creature and God, obviously. Okay. Any, mm-hmm. Thomist, any Thomist would know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then there's another sense of participation, which I think he calls logical, in which um, a species participates in a genus. So humanity participates in animal. Mm-hmm. And there's no real relation there because that's, that's just about how a concept participates in a, a more broad concept. In order to make sense of that, you don't have to posit any real relation in mm-hmm. creation or any. Is, real it's merely even. a mental relation. Yeah. Okay. And but the, the participation that Aquinas uses uh, to make sense of creation as a whole and and the manner in which creatures exist is he takes a lot from pseudo Dionysius. He uses the image of the diaphanous air, air that can be lit up by oh. the sunlight that's coming through coming through it and, and enlightening it. So it's it becomes a little bit more mystical and poetical, but he does a lot of metaphysical work in his in his uh, works, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. The more I take these classes, so I took metaphysics two semesters ago with that, that textbook you just showed me, The One of the Many by Father Norris Clark, and it just completely, it completely revolutionized 
mm. my understanding. It, it not revolutionized. It, it made it possible because I, I would read Thomas on my own and I would get some of it here and there. You know, I would get certain articles, objections, you know, his answers, but I didn't have a kind of holistic understanding of mm. what he was on about and, and where he was getting all this from. And, you know, like a key in order to unlock the kind of the yeah. totality of the Summa. And with that book, I, I feel like it was that key that I needed to unlock the, the coherence mm. of, of that work and, and to situate it not only historically, but philosophically, theologically, and all the things that he contributed to in philosophy. So from that book, many questions were super added at the end of the semester. I had so many questions about participation, about universals. I had questions about the relationship between Aristotle and Augustinian tradition. And so I, I left that semester more hungry and, and very dissatisfied in a certain sense. So, um, good, good. Yes. <laughs> that's, the, that's the platonic eros. Um, yes, that's right. That's yeah, right. and, and, and uh, one other contrib contribution you haven't said explicitly about William Norris Clark is that um, I think he only died about three years ago. I'm not, I can't remember. Very recently, that's or, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually sent an email to him before he oh, died, really? obviously. Oh, my goodness. I said, uh, this is when I was way back just toying with ideas. And I said, oh, it was a bit, it's a bit uh, too eager and brash of me. I sort of said, can you, can you recommend this book of mine? And he said, and he wrote, uh, uh, yeah, it was a bit hesitant. <laughs> and that's, that's, the only, <laughs> that's, that's the only email he sent to me. That's a yeah. funny story. I like it. <laughs> I have to dig it up. Yeah. Um, oh, what I was going to say is that with Clark, he wrote a couple of articles, uh, which is, uh, I think he's got a, a collection of essays called God, Being, and the Person. He says, he's claiming uh, that Aquinas is more platonic than a lot of people have since understood. I mean, you still hear it by historians of philosophy that um, a very simplistic idea of Aquinas took Aristotle and made it Christian. Full stop. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, really only half the truth. The way that he takes Aristotle there's also all these other points he's got his you know church fathers the bible plato and also neoplatonism he's looking at all these other things and, and trying to fit them all together no i i noticed that i took ancient philosophy before i took that class and then i noticed yeah this is a neoplatonic structure mm. it's not aristotelian he uses aristotle's you know act and potency as principles to order the neoplatonic mm. structure as Clark puts mm -hmm. it in the book, but also he cites Augustine the most, and Augustine was deeply Platonic, of course, purified by Christianity, the Incarnation, so it's kind of sacramental Platonism. But you're right, I guess the, the point I wanted to make is that I started reading Thomas, and, and I came into school thinking Thomas is an Aristotelian, and so, uh, you know, this I'm pretty sure this is the Aristotelian Thomas school, which I think Maritain is part of, uh, Jacques Maritain. The Aristotelian, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You wouldn't be able to um, pick my brains on that because... Okay, no worries. <laughs> yeah, when it, when, when it gets to the whole Aristotelian schools, thought, there's different schools of thought about Thomism, and I, I, I'm no expert on that. I just, I'm aware that there are different schools of thought, some of whom I think the River Forest School emphasised more the approach where you start with natural philosophy mm -hmm. and from there you get to metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And it's that's emphasising that abstractive sense of knowledge where you begin with the senses and then abstract from there your concepts and you get to metaphysics yeah whereas i think when you emphasize the mystical mm -hmm. participation neoplatonic side of it yeah it sort of comes the other direction and that's the yes. that's the augustine yeah yes yes and Mil Milbank Milbank is doing this uh it's a bit complex he does something he, he's trying to do both but he's definitely leaning towards the participation the mystical Milbeck says a lot about language is never univocal and that when we're speaking about God, we can never fix our language so that we have a formula for, for anything, actually. So Milbank would say, because everything is imbued with mystery, mm -hmm. we'll never have a formula for anything where we can say this is a univocal definition that works and it will be sufficient for all time. Mm -hmm. uh, Milbank's saying, no, we have to keep revising our formulas. That makes it interesting for us as Catholics because we do have dogma, dogmas. Yes, I have so many questions about that. Yes, yes. Well, the thing is, um, 
Murray Tan answered that because he had that discomfort with Bergson because Bergson was saying that there is an experience of God that's mystical and can never be captured in concepts. Yeah. And Maritain sort of, he liked that. There is a mystical side of Maritain, but in the end, he, he couldn't quite reconcile that with church and that we have doctrine in which it is said, this is true and it can't be revised. Mm -hmm. So that's the other side. Uh, how do we fit those two together? Uh, this, this is music to my ears because I've been thinking just about what you're saying. On one side, you have the, the Platonism coming down. And on the other, you have the Aristotelian vision going up. And mm -hmm. some say Thomas is the former, some say he's the latter. Mm -hmm. And also, like, in the history of Thomism, like, you kind of see both schools going back and forth. This is overly simplistic, I know, but but I think really this kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that we find ourselves kind of in a middle, because I see the neo-scholastics very much so as the, the Aristotelian Thomists going from the ground up yeah. and being very kind of rationalistic, you know, analytical. Yeah. And, and then on the other side, you have the, I guess you could say the communal school who's much more interested in Augustine Bonaventure and re reviving the Christian Platonism that is more familiar and comfortable with mystery. And so I've seen that tension in my studies mm -hmm. and the more I read these authors and uh, I just, I'm undecided. And, and I think you're right. It's like the truth really has to be in the middle somewhere, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's elusive. Uh, and I know I know I'm talking too much, but one last thing that that I thought of earlier was the very dynamism of mystery implies a narrowing down, a kind of capturing in a specific place. Like like for example, the incarnation is one of the most specific doctrines of Christianity, and yet it's one of the most mysterious and elusive. Yeah. It's, and so there seems to be a kind of a tension in mystery where you have both the unquantifiable. Mm -hmm but it becomes flesh, right? The word becomes flesh. And so- Yeah, yeah. That's why people always come back to uh, Hans Hans von Balthasar. Yes. Uh, and his understanding of Gestalt, form, because form is definite. You know, the incarnation was the incarnation of a Jewish person, a male at a specific time. And yet there is a depth and significance and a meaning to that that's transcends it at the same time so you've got this interplay between specificity uh particularity yeah. and universality and i think von balthasar does draw on that hegelian language of a concrete universal gotcha yeah that's something that i've been wondering about the classes i took just left me just you know with more questions because of this big debate i mean these many debates but i mean it does bring us back to the second vatican council the church in the 21st century uh, 20th and 21st century and i find myself you know uh, pushing back on both sides because the faith is not a rationalistic enclosed ideology but it is something real at the same time and it can't yeah just it's not be... formless that's it's right not formless that's right. so look i'm having i'm having a bit of a brain freeze and i can't remember the name of that modernist one of the modernists around the early 20th century um, was saying that all of our concepts and all of our practices are all revisable mm -hmm. because they're all just mere symbols because the reality is a mystery and that that's been condemned by the church by mm -hmm. the catholic church mm -hmm. because on that view even the ten commandments can be revised because that was just a particular a cultural expression at the time of something that is ultimately formless really is what he's saying mm -hmm. And you can't go so far into mystery to say that the mystery is formless and any particular expression of it in words or in liturgy or in commandments or morality is revisable. Mm -hmm. that, that means that anything goes. It's, it, it ends up in historicism. Yes, yes. And that was one of the critiques that the, the more traditional side had for, for those who kind of went way far left to use a word that's not helpful. But yeah absolutely yeah and and the, the more i i try to understand all this and talk with people like you and read about books uh, on the subject the more i realize that there really is a spectrum and it's not black and white and so my my solution i guess my per personally speaking my solution was well who do i trust well i mean the answer was pretty clear for me it was the catholic church because it's the one that's always trying to reform to find the balance and to move forward mm. and people are not going to like it sometimes and 
I, mm. I don't know. So that's kind of been my experience is to have faith in Mother Church because Christ established her and made promises. Mm. And if I mm. believe that Christ rose from the dead, I mean, that's where I'm going to go. And uh, mm. I know some of my traditionalist friends don't like that, but but also some of the liberal friends don't like that. And, you know, mm. and there's people even in, in the hierarchy or the, the church politics, you know, we're talking about human beings being redeemed, and, but they're, they're not fully divinized yet, you know. <laughs> so... Yeah, and I do tend to come back to, um, obviously, there's a, there's a lot that's wrong about Hegel, but I find that that idea of the dialectic very helpful and that the idea of paradox where you've got Karl Barth, even Kierkegaard, you really need to press hard into this side and, and capture what, what truth there is in here, but you, then you need to do it on this side, and then you have to try and inhabit that space of paradox as it were, the in-between space. And the one way of doing that is to, to try and outline what is too far this way and what is too far that way and how are we going to inhabit that space. So after reading Milbank, my understanding is that there is a way of doing Thomas Aquinas and philosophy and theology where you're trying to build a system layer by layer where you're saying um, this concept, it's, I guess, a type of foundationalism where you start with this proposition we completely comprehend this proposition here or this concept and then from there we build on it and build on it and build on it mm -hmm. uh, and Milbank's saying no that's not how truth works truth is more holistic we, we come in we come into a paradigm mm -hmm. and we inhabit that paradigm gradually and, and we don't build mm -hmm.